Today's episode is brought to you by our good friends at Mountain Rose Herbs. The folks at Mountain Rose Herbs are committed to providing us herbalists with high quality, organic, and sustainable herbs, spices, essential oils, bulk ingredients, and much more. But quality isn't the only thing they're passionate about. They consider the environmental and social impact of every business decision they make and are dedicated to keeping their business practices sustainable and ethical from start to finish. To Mountain Rose Herbs, people, plants, and planet are more important than profit. And Herb Rally Podcast listeners can get 15% off their order at mountainroseherbs.com using coupon code 22RALLY15. That's 22RALLY15, all one word. So a huge thanks to Mountain Rose Herbs for sponsoring the podcast, and don't forget to use coupon code 22RALLY15 to get 15% off your next order. Now on to the show. Enjoy. I'm following a very steady diet of practically anything written by women. Oh, I love men. It's just that the sorts of books that make men chuckle and pay attention... I find that often these are the sorts of books that say they are about one thing, like botany, but actually are yet another book about famous men. My brain goes to flatline at the first mention of a William or Drake or Henry, unless he is the handsome husband of a clever lady. Julia de Barclay Levy did marry a Spanish journalist, so I might look him up, but she did a lot of things on her own. I've had her books on my shelf so many times and then given them away and found a copy again. Juliet would want it that way, light enough to travel and always learning. If you do collect her books, they should always be old and give off that satisfying book smell. Check for a whiff of dust mites and perhaps even some signs of oats and coffee formerly spilled on it. My first herb teacher put a book like this in my hands emphatically at a used book sale and wrapped my fingers around it. And I did throw down the full 10 cents to $1.50 for it that same day. I'm sure that book had my name on it in Sharpie marker at some point after that, and maybe one of you has even found it lately. Right now, I have two of Juliet's books out of the local public library, and I spent a good two or three hours traveling back and forth in the snow to have these at my side. Talking to folks I met along the way, enthusiastic dogs on their walks lunging at me, and I even sat on a little sled I found at the pond and took a coast down an icy hillside, part of the way to the public library, just brushing myself off before presenting my library card. Juliet would want that so much more than for these to arrive brand new and sterile, vacuum sealed in plastic at the doorstep announced by the sound of the digital scan of the delivery person who then makes themselves scarce by the time you get to the door. There is a lot to say about Juliet, and some of it documented in various biographies of her and her own many very entertaining volumes. She definitely entertains the reader while informing. Juliet was from a wealthy family, you will read, and now I'm just about to yawn and bore myself to tears. I I just about forgot what we were doing. (laughs) It seems that so often this is a statement made about her, but it's and it's worth mentioning, as, as many of the names we hear often, more often hear about are, who else has the time to write and write as much as anyone would want, not clenched by thoughts of bills or delusions or what else one ought to be doing. Some do find a way, though. But she did not exactly live a a stale and sterile life. Close to the earth is more like it. Even in New York, where she once described a fear that in the place she and her children were living, that the bed bugs would carry off their belongings in the night. This is just one of infinite (laughs) indications of her imagination. Or a little tale of when she had to organize a funeral for their puppy to placate her children and also to deal with the body in New York. Maybe not so easy to do in a dignified way if you're living in a New York apartment. She placed their beloved dog in a basket with its toys and then floated it down the East River and then wept for having given up one of her good baskets. Herbalists, I know you understand. There was also a piece I read somewhere about her having to... uh, 
arrive at a very nice place to stay in New York, but with all of their luggage patched up and dusty and bringing various clay pots with them that they later had to donate because they could not bring all these vessels with them. Again, herbalists, I know you understand. And I think I've said enough for you to want to get into some of her narratives directly. A very, very brief biography now before we get into some of her uses for herbs. Juliet was from England and studied vet in veterinary school for two years. She then took to the road uh, to learn from shepherds and nomadic people and anyone who would teach her. She lived throughout Europe in Turkey and Greece and in North Africa. She lived with the Romani people in Granada at least and in other places as well whom she credits the most of any culture for herbal knowledge and animal care that she has since shared with many. There is so, so, so much to say about her and her life. A lot of it she has said for herself in her various autobiographical books, though always just as rich in sound, useful information about the care and handling of the body and for animals. Just for example, she even lends a not slim chapter called About Medicine to her book called Traveler's Joy. She says, Travelers going into lonely places and living there for a while need to be able to doctor themselves when injured or ill. Such knowledge is part of travel survival. And then, of course, she elaborates greatly. On anything from common ailments like earaches, headaches, headaches from coldness and dryness or dampness, to barbed wire tears and jellyfish stings, all of these are mentioned just effortlessly. To quote her, instinctively I bathed in icy water when I had typhus. She says this nonchalantly and then not even boastfully describes the diaphoretic properties of yarrow and the laxative effects of rhubarb. Care of feet, backs, traveler's stomach, toothache, stiff neck, sun and wind burns, scorpion bites, sea urchin spikes, fleas, snake bites, dog bites, and various food and waterborne illness are covered here equally nonchalantly. I'd like to say that this isn't even said to be an herbal book and includes more honest-to-goodness herbal remedies than many sources claiming to be herbal instructional books do. Since I am leaving, leading you and leaving you in suspense a little, let's just go into what she carries as travel first aid or a travel first aid kit. Quoting, a roll of cotton wool, a pair of small tweezers for splinters and for ear dressings, a roll of cotton bandage. In small supply, the following dry items, cloves, charcoal tablets, centipods, chamomile flowers, a bunch of rue, rosemary, wormwood, sage, small unremarkable flasks of mosquito oil, vinegar, castor oil, spirit of eucalyptus, talcum powder, a box of matches, a small flashlight, Total weight, about one pound. If this is too much for you to consider, she says, see where else you can cut weight in your luggage. For example, she describes cutting the wooden covers off of any books that she carries, and then you won't know the difference. And how about a few herbal remedies from the book from the book of hers that I've held on to the longest, which is the complete herbal handbook for farm and stable. It's really a resource like no other. Now, some herbal books about animal care go into great length and detail about common sense care, and Juliet definitely does too. But her sources are also not at all scarce on herbal remedies and also the details of actual experience, or at the very least, witnessing and careful observance. If that can't be proven, she was at the very, very least a good listener though she is known to have traveled far and wide caring for animals, many times animals that were traveling with her. Um, And she has included those um, stories and anecdotes uh, as well in her stories of her travels, in addition to uh, in her herbal books. Let's go into maybe 10 or a dozen, 13 little examples I can comment on and quote briefly. Pardon the interruption, the show will be back on shortly. 
People will sometimes say, Mason, how can I support you and your work? There is so much free content on Herb Rally, and it'd be nice to give back somehow. I used to say, please rank and review the show. It means the world to us, which is still great. Please rank and review in your podcast player of choice. Uh, but now I'd say becoming an Herb Rally Schoolhouse member is one of the best ways you can support our small family herbal business. If you've ever heard of Patreon, it's kind of like that. Uh, basically, you're directly supporting our work by spending $10 a month and becoming a member of the Herb Rally Schoolhouse, or patron, if you will. Membership includes exclusive content, and we release new content each week. And the library of available content just keeps growing over time with a variety of teachers and classes, which means the schoolhouse just keeps offering more, adding more value to you as you continue on your herbalist journey. There's also a bunch of discounts for cool herbal businesses in there as well, uh, plus some other features to the membership. So if you'd like to check it out and get your first 30 days for free, you can use coupon code PODCAST when you register at herbrelly.com slash schoolhouse. Again, that's herbrelly.com slash schoolhouse and use coupon code PODCAST at checkout to get your first 30 days for free. Thanks so much for your time and support. Now back to the show. Adder's Tongue. And I selected this one because it's not one that we really talk about or use or even have so much in the U.S. where I am. This is a fern plant of fields and waste places. One broad leaf which grows with the stalk several inches from the ground, distinguished by its dark smooth oval leaves and flowering part resembling a small green tongue, being thin, hard, and a spike, and is the chief distinguishing feature of this plant, giving it its name. A supreme wound herb, general preparation is infusing the leaf and spike in warm olive oil, brewing it gently, not boiling. A, foam, a fine balsam of brilliant green color is thus produced. Apply to all wounds, sores, bruises, ulcers. The whole plant is used also. Agrimony. This is a plant of hedgerow and field, distinguished by its bramble-like thornless leaves. It bears spokes of small yellow flowers of rose form. The fresh flowers have a scent of apricots. Sheep and goats will eat it, but horses and cows leave it alone. It is classed as a magic herb. The flower spines yield an attractive yellow dye. And for uses, it is said to... Uh, chiefly be a remedy for jaundice from which it derives its botanical name, Eupatoria. It should be given to fasting animals as a drench or finely cut and mixed in with bran. It is also a valuable astringent to stem bleeding and is a remedy for sore throats. And you may know agrimony as a very astringent, rose family astringent. I included that one because there are also so many, in addition to it being a pretty common plant, um, though not always noticed, um, there are lots of old magical uses and symbolism associated with the plant. So it's always fun to mention that and see where that may lead you in researching further if that is something that you are interested in. There's really quite a lot of lore associated with agrimony. Here's a fun one. Anise. The whole plant is strongly aromatic. The seeds and are extracted uh, oil are used. The seeds can be purchased from herbalists and grocers. Dogs like anise so much that it was once used as a bait by dog thieves. Use is as a carminative, unsurpassed, and an important remedy for all digestive ailments, including colic, and especially good for young animals. The dose is said to be one heaped handful of seeds daily. For the critters, that is. Artichoke, Cynara scolimus. A well-known vegetable with tall, serrated, fan-form gray-green leaves. The fruits are born at the ends of long stems and are eaten in their globe-shaped bud form before they open into purple thistle-type flowers. The ray florets will curdle goat and sheep milk strongly enough to make excellent hard cheeses. And in Spain, it is used as an aperitif. Cynara is made from the artichoke. This cynara is a bitter tonic and is also used for animals. Artichoke contains cyanose, which aids digestion and is rich in vitamin A and iron. The use for animals is two or three of the globe heads daily. 
or feed several handfuls of the leaves and cut up stems. Next up is bramble, which I definitely learned as useful for animals, for livestock, for um, critters on the farm. <laughs> so here's what she has to say. This is a common hedgerow and woodland plant distinguished by its thorny foliage and stems and white rose-like flowers. The plant bears black edible fruits, the familiar blackberry. It is one of the most important of the wild plants being eaten with the avidity by all animals. It should be encouraged to grow in every pasture. A brew of the roots is an effective remedy for prolonged diarrhea. The foliage is a famed cure for eczema. And here we are talking about blackberry, Rubus fructicosus of the Rosaceae family. However, let's not get too picky because she also says, and I have also learned, all the species of the genus Rubus share the same medicinal properties, raspberry, dewberry, loganberry, all the fruits are refreshing and tonic. Blackberry fruits are astringent. Raspberries are mildly laxative and very cooling and soothing in fevers. And it is said to be a great tonic in pregnancy. Additional uses include treatment of all gastric weaknesses, failing appetite, diarrhea, impoverished nerve and skin disorders. Think of it as one of the many common herbs that can be used in poultices. And here's a fun little thought and tip. Uh, the white underside draws when applied to the skin and the green upper side soothes. I had not ever considered that, but makes sense. We know that the white undersides have a velvety quality, and so it makes sense that they might be a bit drawing. But generally think of this herb as a classic and really available definite astringent, both inside and out. And one of the main first uses I learned for it was as an anti-diarrheal in small doses of tincture for humans, like five drops at a time. Um, and that more than that could be potentially uh, a bit overkill or cause some undesirable side effects. And here are a few more of Juliet's words before we move on to the next plant. The gypsies say that fresh plucked leaves warmed over a fire will heal most diseased places. The pulped leaves are applied to burns and foot blisters. The dose, two handfuls of the leaves or fruits daily, a famed Spanish gypsy tonic for horses and mules is a decoction of the young leaves. The horse is given a pint daily. And externally, brew one handful of leaves to one and a half pints of water and bathe the affected area twice daily. Next up is horse chestnut, Asculus hippocastinum. And this is a plant that I learned to use, um, use oil infusions of the nut uh, externally for things like varicose veins um, and bruises and really didn't use it for many other uses other than those. But here's some more. The name horse chestnut derived from the greedy eating of the fruits by horses and the subsequent curing of their cough and chest ailments. This nut was a great remedy once for broken-winded horses. The nut flour mixed with molasses and licorice and fed several times daily over one month. Another reason for na the naming horse chestnut, Spanish peasants used the nuts for all of their animals, including cows and poultry. The milk-producing animals yield a very rich milk when getting chestnuts as a supplement. If the animals refuse the nuts, the bitter property should be removed by pounding the nuts with a stone, steeping for four hours in a mild solution of lime and water, washing well, and then lightly heating to form a meal. Large quantities of a highly nutritious starch are thus produced. She says it is fed to all animals as a general tonic and a strengthener of the pulmonary areas. The dose for the larger animals is one to three handfuls of prepared chestnuts daily. Now this means for horses or cows. And a warning, if the chestnuts are shop bought, wash them well because in common with many types of nuts and fruits, they are often treated with a chemical spray to deter insects and rodents from eating them. 
I thought this little excerpt was neat because although I've definitely learned horse chestnut, it even if I learned this part about its name before, it had not stuck with me. And I was really not as aware of its use with horses, or at least traditional use. We have next Stellaria medii, or chickweed. And this is one that I definitely use with animals, with humans. Most of the time topically, but not exclusively. From Juliet, it is one of the few readily edible herbs containing a richness of copper. All animals should be encouraged to feed upon it, but sheep must be prevented from overgorging themselves, especially lambs, or severe digestive upset can follow owing to the richness of the herb. And in her words, it is one of the herbs most praised by Turkish gypsies, not only for its edible qualities, but also its potent medicinal properties, as it contains many of the soothing and tonic powers of slippery elm. True, this is yet another super demulcent. The whole plant is used. It is a highly tonic food for the digestive system and a remedy for all stomach ailments. And Juliet goes on to describe a couple of different methods of salve making, um, but I would say you can use methods you have learned previously. I typically just infuse it in some extra virgin olive oil and then add a bit of wax. Um, you know, melting these together. So that part's simple. And as far as topical use in a salve, there are many uses, but I would keep it simple in this case and just say that it's a nice soothing, demulcent, somewhat cooling herb and has sometimes been used for, um, you know, irregularities at the surface or reducing um, excess and little, you know, swollen areas, helping things move along. Since this source does have a focus on animals, I will add um, that she calls it an important tonic for food, uh, tonic food for poultry and all birds, especially caged birds. And I have learned this as well. The dose, she says, is several handfuls per animal per day. We'll do a brief on chickweed. This is a plant of fields and pastures and also waste places. And it was one of the earlier herbs that I learned, definitely. And just a sort of often available bitter remedy. Its color is chicory blue. It's a nice classic aster family plant and has a long taproot, which she mentions benefits the soil. That is keeping the soil from becoming too compacted. She says it's beneficial to grazing cattle and the general use is for general debility, including or especially weak or failing appetite or digestion, and all liver weaknesses, including jaundice. As for our own use, I just like to nibble on a flower or two as a digestive bitter or use the root as a nice bitter coffee substitute. Substitute that is for the flavor. And for animals, she suggests two ounces of the finely shredded root given in bran. I think this is for the larger animals. And in cases of illness, um, two ounces of herb to one and a half pints of water as an infusion given divided during the day. Hey everyone, it's Mason. Just a quick interruption from the show to let you know about our 13 herbal freebies. If you go to herbrally.com on the navigation bar at the top of the page, you'll see a button that says freebies. Just click there and you'll sign up for our email newsletter. And in exchange, we're offering 13 herbal freebies. That's eBooks, webinars, videos, downloadable audio, and discounts to cool herbal companies. So if you'd like to check out these freebies as well as sign up for our email newsletter, we update you about uh, current events, new monographs, new videos, etc. Just go to herbrally.com and click on the button at the top of the page that simply says freebies. Okay, that's it from me. Now back to the show. We have next feverfew. And this is an interesting one that I typically consider just for things like migraine headache, which is not to say that it is always helpful, but it's one of the few things that can be helpful for an issue that is very difficult to change or remedy once it started. But it's interesting that Juliet has a different use, which also makes sense as far as what we know about its effects on physiology. 
So she's also actually suggesting it as um, a digestive aid and tonic, which that's not an uncommon use. Almost every herb is, but also for really a range of uterine support uses. And I might suggest that this could have a bit to do with encouraging circulation and acting as an antispasmodic. We know or believe that feverfew does this for our head and brain. Um, in other words, uh, helping to kind of regulate circulation to the head and brain and reduce um, spasticity in the lining of blood vessels. And I might imagine that it could have some similar effects uh, for the blood supply to the uterine muscle and perhaps also the action of the uterine muscle. So she suggests this for all sorts of uterine issues that sort of look like spasming or um, sort of reduced circulation or weakness of the you know, weakness or irregularity of the action of the uterine muscle. And again, her suggestions for giving it are either as the whole or fresh herb or as an infusion. Next up, garlic. And she has a long section on garlic, and we definitely use it with animals. I mean, by we, herb herbalists who I've learned with and myself. So I'll just exert, I'll just take a few little excerpts of hers. Because of its remarkable penetrative disinfective and mucus expellent powers, garlic is a val valuable basic remedy for the treatment of all ailments in which the cleansing of the bloodstream and expulsion of mucus accumulations are required. And she emphasizes the lungs and digestive areas. She adds, scientists have discovered a substance that is excellent for diseases of the nose, throat, and intestine. And it is also of special use as a febrifuge and vermifuge. And though there is really a lot set of garlic in this section, I'll say that also when I lived in a rural area uh, and had my herbal product business, I did have farmers who specialized in holistic care or were interested approach me for different garlic preparations as well as echinacea. And this was most often for support during calving season um, when both respiratory issues and uh warming are both concerns, common concerns. Garlic is one of the herbs that you're going to be able to find a lot of information on, so we'll leave it at that for now. About three more herbs, and then I will leave you hopefully intrigued to learn more about Juliet. The next one I've selected of her many, many, I don't know if I mentioned her Materia Medica section is close to 300 pages in the Complete Herbal Handbook for farm and stable. But for hops, let's see what we have. Um, we have use in digestive ailments for failing appetite and used mixed with fodder to quiet restless animals. All of these sound pretty reasonable, so we'll move on. We have horseradish, a nice spicy one. So this is one that grows in many gardens. She calls it an internal antiseptic and a diuretic and a good warming plant to feed to animals in cold weather. And her dose for the larger critters, so things like horses uh, or cows, are one or two roots grated and mixed with bran given twice daily or the grated roots stirred into hot water one heaped teaspoon to a half a cup of water. We know that this one is very, very pungent, so it doesn't take so much. And we'll end it on Iceland moss. And this is a plant that I don't know that much about, but it does keep coming up for me. So let's, let's include it. This time I'll quote her exactly. This plant is a native of Britain and northern countries of Europe and naturally of Iceland. It grows from two to four inches high and is usually brownish or grayish of color, although sometimes also of a red shade. This lichen plant is dry and cartilaginous and dries up into a gray-white powder. It swells up when put into water and when boiled and cooled, it becomes a fine jelly. 
This plant is immensely life-giving and nutritious and will sustain life uh, where little else grows. It is a favorite with reindeer. I found that pretty fun, a favorite with reindeer. And essentially, she is suggesting that this is a nice nutritive herb, which is how we know it, and also a great respiratory support herb. She suggests one teaspoon stirred into one large cup of boiling water. Or a half cup of water can be used and then further half cup of milk added when the mixture has cooled to tepid for young animals add honey or molasses. So there we have the very sweet Juliet de Barclay Levy. If you're interested in some classic uses of herbs for animals and common sense animal care told in a very colorful, memorable way, I definitely recommend looking into more of her writings. Juliet has passed many years ago, so this was just sort of for fun and out of admiration. I did quote or paraphrase extensively from The Complete Herbal, and you'll find she has perhaps a dozen or more really colorful, interesting books about her travels and about care for animals and generally her whimsical way of living. That's all. Thank you so much. And that's going to do it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Herb Rally podcast. If you'd like to hear more from us here at Herb Rally, we now have a text message community, believe it or not. Basically, it's just updates from us. We send about one to seven texts per week, uh, notifying you about new events, videos, courses, podcasts. You get the idea. It's pretty much like our email newsletter, just in text form. So if you'd like to receive text messages from Herb Rally, just text JOIN, that's J-O-I-N, to the number 541-256-2895. Again, that's join to number 541-256-2895. And to stop receiving texts, that's easy too. Just text STOP to the same number. It'll opt you out immediately. Okay, thanks again for listening. Have a great rest of your day.